Welcome to the Feed Your Family Tonight podcast. Do you dread hearing the question, what's for dinner? Whether you spend your days keeping up with toddlers, running kids to after school activities, or juggling a career and family, getting dinner on the table can be a struggle for us all. I'm Marie Feebach, a business owner, wife, and mom of four. I'm on a mission to build stronger families one dinner at a time, and I'm here with tips, tricks, and inspiration you need to feed your family tonight. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Feed Your Family Tonight podcast, episode 157. I'm your host, Marie Feebach, and today we are going to be talking about meals that have long hands-off cooking time. If you are listening to this live time, it is November in Kansas. I am sitting in my bedroom office with a blanket over my lap, and I just turned off my space heater because it makes noise while I record, but I can't wait to stop recording and turn the space heater back on. We've hit that time where you don't quite want to turn the heater on, but it's a little chilly in the house. And one of the first things that my brain goes to when we start getting this colder weather is long, slow cooked meals. During the summer, you know, I try not to turn the oven on too, too much, but I'm not afraid to like roast some vegetables or something. During this time of year, I am thinking about things that go in the oven and in the slow cooker that have long hands off cooking time. And that's what we're going to focus on today. When you are getting your meal plan ready. And I'm having you use the Feed Your Family Tonight weekly meal planning sheet. If you don't have that, go to feedyourfamilytonight.com slash plan and get your free copy. It has a place to look at your time. And you're looking at your time and your activities. And oftentimes, something that takes an hour or two to three hours to cook can be a busy mom's friend. Because you can get it prepped the night before or earlier in the day and then just slip it into the oven or the slow cooker and it does its magic over time while you are running your kids to practice or you are dealing with after school homework. Long, slow, hands-off cooking is wonderful and this time of year is made for those kinds of recipes. I'm going to kind of go through some of my favorite recipes that I have that have long hands-off cooking time. And as I go, I'm kind of going to give you some tips about long hands-off cooking time. The first tip that I want to talk about is a lot of times people are thinking about larger cuts of meat that roast in the oven for a long amount of time. I mean, Thanksgiving is the quintessential of that where you're thinking about a turkey, but we're also thinking about like roast beef and roast chicken. And when you are having larger pieces of meat that are slow roasting in the oven, you also need to think about the prep and what it's going to take to get those large pieces of meat to the oven. The first thing is if you are taking it from frozen, they take a long time to thaw in the refrigerator. If I'm doing a four or five pound roast, I'm usually thawing it two days ahead of time. And even then there still might be a few ice crystals If I'm doing a whole chicken that's been in the freezer, I'm definitely thawing it for at least two to three days, sometimes even four. And I have a whole thing about turkey. If you want to know about thawing and roasting turkeys, I'll link to my podcast episode on turkeys because they take a great amount of time to thaw. When you have this time in your refrigerator that these large pieces of meat are thawing, It is also a really great opportunity to season your meat well. And by that, I mean, add salt. I've said before that salt plus time equals magic for meats. It's definitely something that I do when I have a roast. I will write on my meal plan and you can see this. I post my meal plans on Instagram every Monday is I will write thaw roast And then the next day, I'm going to say salt roast. And then the third day is when I'm actually cooking it. I don't want to put salt on a solid frozen block of meat, although you could. But usually I like to get it at least partially thawed. And then you add the salt to the outside. And what happens is back to seventh grade science class, and we're talking about osmosis. What happens is the salt dissolves in the little bit of liquid that exudes on the meat 
And then that liquid will take the actual sodium, the sodium from the salt, and will draw it into the meat. And that is going to help the salt penetrate. But that doesn't happen quickly. It takes time for the salt. So you want to give large chunks of meat at least 24 hours with their salt on them so that the salt has time to penetrate. But honestly, I have found with my roast chickens that if I salt them two or even three days ahead of time, they are extra delicious. Same with a large roast. It, I always try and give it at least 24 hours, but if it has 48 or even 72, it's even better. Now, again, for me, a large chicken open air in my refrigerator, it's kind of messy. Like I don't really want that sitting in my refrigerator too, too long. And so I tend to only do it for 24 hours. But there have been days where I'd planned on doing it 24 hours ahead of time. And then I end up with a backup meal on the day that I was supposed to make the chicken. We all have days where the wheels fall off and we have to get something on the table fast and cooking a chicken for an hour just isn't going to happen. And so I've let that chicken set for an extra day or so. And oh my goodness, it is so delicious. When you are looking at doing hands-off cooking when large things of meat, make sure that you put on your weekly meal planning sheet two, three, even four days ahead of time to thaw the meat and then salt the meat so that it has time to do its magic and your food is going to taste so much better. But again, you're only spending like a minute or two salting it and a minute taking it out of your freezer and putting it into your refrigerator to thaw. So there's not a lot of hands on time. And it's the same when you put it in the oven. It might be cooking for two to three hours, but you don't have to do anything to it. You just put it in the oven. Now, a lot of people this time of year start wanting slow cooker meals. And I have said before that I I use my slow cooker. My favorite thing to use my slow cooker for is to make chicken broth. I usually let my chicken broth cook for 24 hours. And if you want that recipe, I will link to it in the show notes. But I also know that I am not the best person at slow cooker meals. And my friends, Polly and Rachel at Thriving Home, they are excellent with slow cooker and instant pot meals. I've said before, they have these wonderful one hour freezer prep sessions where you spend one hour and you make six meals to go for your freezer. It's early November, and now is a great time to kind of get your freezer stocked up with some freezer meals as we head into the busy season of the holidays towards the end of this month and moving into December. If you are interested in their one-hour freezer meal prep sessions or their books on slow cooking, I'll link to it in the show notes. It's at thrivinghomeshop.com, and be sure to use my discount code, Marie 20 to get 20% off your purchase. The thing about it is, is that Polly and Rachel know what they are talking about when it comes to the slow cooker. And there's a few things that they talk about that I completely agree with. And a lot of it has to do with food safety. I've said before that I am a stickler when it comes to food safety. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make with their slow cooker is that they are overcooking their food. We all want a slow cooker recipe that we can put in the slow cooker at eight o'clock in the morning and have dinner ready when we get home at five or 530. But when you are doing that, even on low, your food is likely overcooking. Chicken breasts in the slow cooker only take three to four hours on low. Bone-in chicken takes a little bit longer, but there are very few recipes that can really last nine or 10 hours in your slow cooker. So you want to be choosing how you do your slow cooker meals carefully to make sure that you're going to have food that tastes delicious and that it isn't overcooked. On the flip side of that is that it is not safe to put frozen meat in your slow cooker as a way of extending that slow cooker time. And that's because that meat is sitting in that danger zone of 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit way too long. And that danger zone is where bacteria grows and that's where you get foodborne illnesses. And I don't want to get into all the ickies of that, but you really want to make sure that you are not putting frozen food into your slow cooker because it isn't safe. Now, if you have frozen food, your instant pot is great for that because 
your food moves quickly from that frozen, which is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, above that 140 degrees Fahrenheit. It is not staying at that temperature very long. Most instant pot meals, you're only cooking it for about you know, seven to 25 minutes. On rare occasions, you might go up to 90 minutes. But even at that, you are not having that food sit for hours in that 40 to 140 degree danger zone. So Instant Pot works really good when your food is frozen. But here is my biggest tip for Instant Pot or slow cooker meals is since you can't be really putting it in the slow cooker eight o'clock in the morning and coming home at five o'clock at night and having dinner ready because your food's going to be overcooking. My best tip is to prep things that go into your slow cooker or instant pot and put them in the liner. You can do this in the morning after breakfast. You can do this the night before and put them in your refrigerator. So you've got everything prepped inside the liner And then you just put that liner in the refrigerator. And then when it's time to actually cook, adding heat to your meal, you can take that liner out of the refrigerator, put it into the appliance and turn it on. And that way you can still have the advantage of this hands off cooking time, but you're not going to be over cooking your food. One little caveat on that is if you have things that have white potatoes, like russet potatoes or Yukon gold potatoes, You want to make sure that the potatoes are submerged in some type of liquid. If they are just kind of open to the air, they're going to turn gray and oxidized and very unappetizing. So if you are putting something into your liner that cooks with potatoes, make sure that the potatoes are submerged in some liquid or have them already sitting in a bag of water or a bowl of water and just transfer them from that to your slow cooker when you go to cook them because you want to make sure that your potatoes don't turn gray and icky. I'm going to transition from large roasted pieces of meat and things in the slow cooker to another type of food that often is long hands off cooking time and that is soups. I have a whole episode on soups and I will freely admit that my family is not the biggest fan of soup, but I personally love soup. And the best soups usually start with a really good broth or stock. Now you can buy box broth and box stock and heaven knows I totally do. But if you want to take your soups to the next level, one of the best things that you can do is make your own broth. And I have recipes on the website for my slow cooker chicken bone broth and my roasted beef bone broth. We get our beef from a local farmer. And one of my favorite parts of that is that I always ask for the soup bones, and the marrow bones. If you are not familiar with the different kinds of beef bones, soup bones usually have some type of a meat on them. I often get shanks. I'll use short ribs. And then marrow bones are bones that do not have any meat on them. When I am making beef soup, I always want to make sure that I have some meaty bones, but I will also add some marrow bones. And that usually makes the the soup or makes the broth a little bit more gelatinous because you're getting more of those minerals and the collagen and the gelatin that is in the beef bones from the marrow bones as well. And the key to making extra rich broth is to roast the bones until they are starting to brown before you add them to the liquid. I do this with my chicken bones. I will take them and I will, after I clean off all the meat off of my roast chickens, I will put the bones on a sheet pan and put them back into the oven at 450 degrees for about 30 or 45 minutes until the bones start to brown. And I do this with my beef bones. I roast them until the meat on them is really brown and the bones themselves start to brown. And when you add this to the water and the other seasonings in your broth, it is going to add such a great depth of flavor. So if you are wanting to do soups, these are both hands off things. My beef broth roasts in the oven for two to three hours, and it can go even longer if you want. And my chicken broth is 24 hours in my slow cooker on the lowest setting. And both of those make extra rich 
extra delicious soups. And I like to make the broth in batches and keep it in my freezer so that I can actually have fast soups on other days. So I'll usually make like a double batch and we'll have the one that I made fresh that night and then the extras will go into my freezer and I will have it to make wonderful soups. Another one of my favorite kind of hands-off things to do with soups is to sweat my vegetables. Now, if you have never heard of sweating vegetables, it is a way of extracting so much flavor from your typical aromatics. When I say typical aromatics, that's usually celery, carrots, and onions. Those are the three that I do most of the time. You could put in some shallots, you could put in some garlic. When you are sweating vegetables, I usually chop them and I put them with just a tiny, tiny bit of oil and just a little bit of salt. And you want to be really careful not to add too much salt because if you add too much salt, they're going to concentrate and get too salty. Ask me how I know because I have done that several times. And you are going to cook them low and slow in a covered skillet. The salt causes the vegetables to release some of their water and they will gently cook. You're not actually looking to have your vegetables browned for this. You're just letting them gently cook. And this isn't completely hands off. I usually kind of go down to my kitchen and stir them about once every 15, 20 or 30 minutes to make sure they're not browning. And if they start to brown a little bit, I'll even add a little bit of water. But these slow cooked vegetables that haven't browned, they're just releasing some of their natural water and the water kind of evaporates and they have that salt and just a teeny tiny bit of oil can make any soup have so much flavor. I will even make just like a giant batch of these sweated vegetables and I will keep them in my refrigerator and then I'll just kind of add them to things, especially when I'm trying to fix like my lunches and stuff where I'm making soup for my lunches add them with a little bit of broth and whatever little odds and ends of roasted vegetables or meats or things that I have in my refrigerator and make it for a lunch for me. And it is absolutely delicious. So friends, those are a few ideas about how to have long, slow cooked meals that are pretty much hands off. It's perfect for this colder weather. I will link into the show notes some of my favorite recipes. I've got a few slow cooker recipes for tortilla soup and barbecue beef and my bone broth and some amazing baked beans. And then some of my favorite slow cooked oven meals like French dip sandwiches and roast chicken. I'll link to those in the show notes so you can find those recipes. If you're wanting really good slow cooker recipes, check out my friends at thrivinghome.com. Polly and Rachel know what they are doing with the slow cooker. And I would love it if you join me in the Feed Your Family Tonight Facebook group and tell us about some of your favorite foods that have long hands off cooking because this is the time of year for those recipes. For now, friends, I hope you are doing well. Take care. Take care.